Hi, welcome to Christ Church. I'm David Hall, the vicar here. Um, just one or two uh, things I'd like to say in my welcome uh, today, um, Sunday the 17th of January. Um, the church is physically closed to congregations, but we are running all our services online. So whichever service you join, I hope you'll really be blessed and encouraged. We'll be reviewing that policy weekly, looking forward to maybe finding ways that we can open that are appropriate to the circumstances that we face, particularly the infection rate in our local community and being responsive to that. Um, our youth and children's work is all taking place online. It is obviously easier connecting with the older age groups than the younger ones, but again, we're doing appropriate engagement with children and young people online to help and encourage and support families. Do remember in your prayers those who are ill or who've been bereaved, um, and also the work uh, this week, the work of the PCC as it meets later on this week. Um, this Sunday, we are putting a sermon summary attached to the website. It's the sermon summary from the morning talks, both at 8.30 and at 10.30. And it's got questions in it, either for small group discussion, perhaps in your home group or indeed your friendship circle, um, or individual study, if you want to think deeper about the issues that are raised by the passage that we are looking at in those services. Uh, we're also planning to do an online alpha course starting very shortly as well as other discipleship options and we'll let you know more of those things in due course. However you join us today, wherever you are, we really hope that God will bless and encourage you. These are challenging times but we believe God is also on the move and he is extending his kingdom. God bless. Hello Christchurch kids and spiritual kids. This morning we continue with looking at the armour of God. If you can't remember, maybe you can test that, the grown up in your house and see if they remember or if they know what it's about. You can also find it in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 17. Um, it's great, so look it up and test each other. Um, now in that verse, it tells us to be strong and to put on the full armour of God. And when we put on the full armour of God, we become strong. This week, we're gonna be looking at the belt of truth. Now, you might just be thinking, it's just a belt. I've got it with me. You might be thinking, it's just a belt. It's not as cool as the sword or even the shield or the helmet. But it's really important we remember to put on the belt of truth. When we put on the belt of truth, we can stand up for things that are right and things that are good. Um, it's important we speak the truth to not lie, even if we really want to or even if it's really hard even if we think we might get into trouble or even if we really want something so we make up a story to get that or if we think we're going to hurt our friend's feelings we should always always tell the truth because if we tell the truth people will believe us when we tell them really important things i can't lie to my friends and family but tell them that jesus is real otherwise they won't believe me so it's really important we tell the truth the enemy loves to trick us as well. And one of the ways he tricks us is by lying to us. He tells us sneaky lies about ourselves and about our friends and family and people that are really important to us. And sometimes we believe, we believe him, but the belt of truth is there to help us. It encircles us. So when we put it on, it encircles all the way around us into every part of our life. And when we put it on, it helps us to spot lies miles away so we can spot them and remember the truth. And Jesus is the truth. So we can remember that when we wear the belt of truth. Let's remember to put on the belt of truth along with all the other bits of the armour every day. Why don't you pray with me? Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for your special armour and how we can put it on every day to protect us. I pray that all of us can remember to put it on and to remember how important it is to tell the truth. And I just pray that you'd remind us um, how important it is to tell the truth and because we want people to know um, that we are truth tellers and that we stand up for what is right and what is good. And we're sorry for whenever we've not said true things and we pray that you'd forgive us and we thank you for your forgiveness. Amen. See you next week on our next bit. Bye.
very warm welcome to our 10.30 service today. Whether you're at home in Chorley Wood or across the globe, it's lovely to be with you. We're all one church family. I'm Terence Russell, the curate here at Christchurch, and it's my pleasure to be leading our service today. And we begin with an opening prayer. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you now. We thank you for this opportunity to praise your name and to worship you. You are a God of love and goodness. And we thank you for all that you give to us. In the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we now come to a time of confession. So why don't we just pause for a moment and just bring before the Lord those things for which we need to say sorry and to ask his forgiveness. O oh Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. And together, Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Together, Lord, hear us and help us. Lift our minds above earthly things. Set them on things above. Show us your power and your glory that we might serve you gladly all our days. Amen. And now hear this comforting assurance of God's forgiveness from 1 Thessalonians 5. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify us through and through. May our whole spirit and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls us his faithful, and he will do it. Amen. And knowing God's forgiveness, let's say together this joyful anthem of praise from Psalm 105. And we stand as we say this. Together. Give Thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Amen. Well, we remain standing as we worship the Lord now together with two songs recognising his presence among us. And as we draw into worship, some words from Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Well, let's remain standing to worship.
Well, we now come to our intercessions. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we bring before you our world and the COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for all those working on vaccines and their rollout, that Christ may fill them with wisdom and insight. We pray for all the frontline medical and support workers who are working under such exhausting pressures in often traumatic situations. We pray that Christ may fill them with strength and mercy. We pray for all those in governing positions and those advising them that Christ may fill them with wisdom as they seek proportionate and effective decisions. We pray for all those worried about their own health and those they love and care for, that Christ may support and sustain them with his comfort and love. We pray for all those worried about their employment and finances, or their businesses under threat, or education disrupted. We pray that Christ may fill them with peace. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. Lord of compassion, in your mercy, hear us. Heavenly Father, we lift up our world and the many places where there are political tensions, conflicts and persecutions. We think right now of the struggle for freedom in Hong Kong, the current political turmoil in the United States, and the many, many nations where ordinary Christians are being persecuted daily. We pray that a spirit of peace and reconciliation will prevail and that hearts will be turned to you. We pray for all those who work to expose injustice and persecution. And we pray for an outpouring of justice and love for all. Lord of compassion, in your mercy, hear us. Heavenly Father, there are many families in our community where there is sickness, pain and mourning over the loss of loved ones. And in a moment of silence, we lift up those we know who are ill, grieving or in distress at this time. We pray that all those in distress may know your comfort and peace and loving arms around them. Lord of compassion, in your mercy, hear us. And we draw our prayers to a conclusion with the Lord's Prayer in its traditional form. And we say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, we now come to our Bible reading, and this week it is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, and I'm reading from the ESV version. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounced, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, well, do keep the passage in front of you. Matthew 7, verses 1 to 6. Matthew 7, verses 1 to 6. And let's pray as we open up these verses and as we look at them and we see what God has for us today. Let's pray. Oh, loving God, we thank you that we get the privilege today of looking at yet more teaching, uh, wonderful, inspired teaching from your son, Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth. And Lord, we thank you that these words are not locked in the past. They are living in the present and they can change the future. So loving God, speak to us as you spoke to the early disciples as they listened to these life-changing words for the sake of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we continue our pandemic series um, and uh, we're looking together um, at uh, Matthew 7 verses 1 to 6 under the title, God's command to not to judge others in a pandemic. God's command not to judge others in a pandemic. With the red laser dots lighting up his car in the darkness, Michael Emmett realized that the armed police had him in their sights and he screamed to his accomplice to put the foot down um, uh, on the accelerator, but there was no escape. And with a gun pointing at his head, Michael was dragged from the car and he was busted carrying out the biggest cannabis smuggling operation in UK history. What had started with stealing from Woolworths when he was aged 11 had become organized crime, leading to a long prison sentence. And Michael's story was covered at some length uh, in Friday's edition of the Sun newspaper, including how he came to Christ. Uh, while he was in prison, he attended an Alpha course. A team from Holy Trinity Brompton visited the prison to do a service, and Michael came to Christ. And this is how he described how it happened for him. He said, a miracle took place. Something changed. It not over, only overwhelmed me, but it overwhelmed everyone in that room. And after many years as a Christian, Michael still feels that he has work to do. He said, listen, I make mistakes, he says. I, I, don't, I still don't like traffic wardens. Um, I like him already. Um, but, but I'm getting better. Something's different in me. He said, I'm not the finished article. I'm work in progress. Well, I bet you're thinking, what an amazing story. But you may well also be thinking, what is the vicar doing uh, reading the Sun newspaper? To which God might say, before you criticize David reading the Sun newspaper, how confident are you that everything that you've looked at over the last um, uh, week or month on your laptop, your phone or whatever screen it is over the last month or two um, is appropriate for a respectable churchgoer? How confident are you that your watching, viewing, reading habits have been of the highest order? You see, the subject of these verses is God's command not to judge others. And the sin of hypocrisy is something that we can so easily slide into. Um, and when we judge others, uh, it can be quite a destructive thing. I mean, in a way, I'm, I'm sufficiently worried that I will be judged by you for saying I've just read an article in the Sun newspaper to, to add that it is perfectly possible to read one article from the Sun newspaper when you're prompted by a friend, as I was, without reading the whole paper. And you go online, you can access just one article. These verses are about judging each other. They're part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus teaching, if you like, about how we should live and how we should grow as human beings within the kingdom of God. So we come to this passage with great expectancy. It's likely to do, to do more for us than just give us a set of instructions like, don't do that. It's likely to contain something life-giving for us to aim for. So the first issue raised by these verses is the issue of personal responsibility, personal responsibility. Before we judge others, are we sure that our lives bear close inspection? Verse one, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It's interesting to note that there's no direct mention here of God's judgment. Uh, this appears to be divine wisdom on human affairs. 
Um, God's wisdom does not just guide us on how we should relate to God or his church. His guidance relates to how we relate to each other within society. And when society abandons that, it can expect conflict, violence, aggression, lots of unhappiness. And the suggestion here is that if we start judging others, we create a climate of judgment which points at us also. Let me give you a relatively high-level practical example of this. Um, General Richard Dannett is not just a committed Christian, but he was head of the army, and of course he was a straight talker. Now I'm going to step away from party politics now, and I'm not going to mention any political party uh, by name, or any government minister by name, or even give any dates, okay? I want to just talk about the principle involved here, and this is a real-life situation that happened in British national life. When Richard Dannett complained about lack of equipment, particularly lack of helicopters in Afghanistan, government sources at the time suggested that he was going to, if he was going to criticise their spending, we ought to take a look at his spending, particularly his expenses. They forgot one thing, that he was an army general and he was used to fighting to win. So he immediately published online his expenses, and it turned out that he had nothing to hide. He'd been very careful with public money. When army top brass visited from other countries, instead of whining and dining them indoors at huge expense, he held barbecues, and he sent squaddies far and wide to secure the best deals. And most notable was their purchase of bottles of Merlot from Lidl for, at the time, £1.49. It's not uh, recorded whether, whether he served that to the French top brass, nor their reaction, but the newspapers were full of admiring headlines about what fun the barbecues had been that he'd thrown for foreign dignitaries and how little that he'd spent of the public's money on this entertainment. Then the journalists began to dig. How much had MPs and ministers spent on whining and dining, they asked. And that information came out, each bottle listed, each price quoted, before they started to accuse and judge Richard Dannett. Someone should have read verses 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is a call to humility and right behaviour, rather than a call to pride and bad behaviour. Further stuff here on the subject of personal responsibility. Verse 3, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Well, I want to first of all point out our common humanity. We're all in the same boat. Specks and logs, they both interfere with our sight. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago when we were, uh, as a family, we were in Annecy in France and Emily got a little speck in her eye and we couldn't get it out uh, and it began to look a little bit serious. So we dashed into this restaurant and in my best French, I said, she's got a speck in her eye. Uh, please can we have water to help her get it out? I think you'll agree that that is not very good French. Anyway, the whole staff of the restaurant gathered round and immediately produced a, a glass of water for her to rinse her eye. Uh, I think it was Evian, actually. Um, anyway, it was all successful. We doused the eye, the speck came out, and she went on her way. Uh, if that is the problem a speck causes, how much more a log? That's a bigger thing, isn't it? Let's be careful. Let's be careful that an unresolved spiritual issue does not blind us and then go on to become, like a log, a burden too heavy to carry. Because perhaps God needs to do important work in your life before you can be useful in helping others. Why do logs and specks matter? Surely sin is sin. And why such interest in our optic nerve here in this metaphor? Well, both logs and specks, they affect sight. Sin affects what you see. 
it deadens our senses. And it's a scary thought that there might be a log in our eyes and we may not even realize it. Is this whole passage just there to make us feel bad? No, it's a call to action. Verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. In other words, those who with God's help have dealt with stuff can be God's help to others dealing with the stuff they need to deal with. Okay, we looked at uh, personal responsibility. I want to now look at the subject of spiritual aspiration. You'd be surprised that spiritual aspiration features here, but it does. There's a lot of talk about how quickly we can vaccinate the population here in the UK. Uh, perhaps we'd, uh, we'd be good to look to America. Uh, the US vet, uh, Mark Primiano, says that in his veterinary practice, when it's vaccination day, he can get through 60 jabs in two hours, he said. And that's with patients that are trying to bite me. Maybe we need to be less friendly and we'll get through more jabs. Well, when we think about spiritual aspiration, why does God use the metaphor of animals attacking people? Verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What on earth does this mean? Well, scholars have struggled to pin down what this means, and here are some of their attempts. The first thought is that dogs and pigs uh, represent Gentiles and other pagans. Uh, and the suggestion has been made by some scholars that basically this is saying the Jews shouldn't waste their time sharing the good news with groups of people who were never part of God's chosen people and never will become part of God's chosen people. But I have a problem with that because in Matthew 8, Jesus shows particular affection for believing Gentiles. And when he comments on the faith of the centurion, um, whose servant he has healed, he says this, truly I tell you with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I don't think these verses can be taken to be some sort of blanket condemnation of the Gentiles and a prohibition in bothering to give them the good news. The other suggested interpretation is this, that we shouldn't waste our breath on people who are not receptive or even distribute Holy Communion to people who do not appreciate it. But notice these two groups of animals, they're not defined by their actions. The dogs here are just dogs. They don't bark or bite. And the pigs here are just pigs. I mean, the, the suggestion they might trample on the pearls and, and attacks, just a possibility. It's not a stated definite outcome. Both groups of animals remain passive, if you like. The only possibility, with, sorry, with only the possibility that they might be active in a destructive way. What is certain is this is a shocking image. Within ancient society, dogs were half wild. They roamed in packs. They would eat whatever scraps they could find, which meant they didn't really care what they ate. And they could occasionally be dangerous to human beings. Pigs had large appetites and would obviously gain no nutritional benefit from pearls. Interestingly enough, pigs were not normally aggressive, except in the defense of their young, and there are no young here in this passage. It seems they're, they're, they're possibly aggressive, if they are aggressive, or there's a threat of aggression, without reason. The balance of nature has been disturbed. And at the center of this disturbing image of violence, of indiscriminate appetite, is an image of great beauty, a string of pearls. To have pearls and to own them is a great privilege. Down through the ages, pearls were the ultimate symbol of wisdom, of serenity, of purity, of integrity, of loyalty of wisdom, of wealth, and of love. They were so exclusive in ancient times that the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar passed a law forbidding anyone below the rank of noblemen from wearing them. The actress Grace Kelly said more recently, the pearl is the queen of gems and the gem of queens. The painter Vincent Vathgoff said this, the heart of a man is very much like the sea. 
It has storms, it has tides, and in its depths, it has pearls. The, winter, the writer um, Stephen Hollier said this, a pearl is a beautiful thing that is produced by an injured life. If we had not been wounded, if we had not been injured, then we will not produce the pearl. To which the Christian might say, Christ was wounded, that we might be pearls. In Matthew 13, verse 45, Jesus says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all he had and bought it. In the context of this passage and all it says about personal responsibility, I think this reference to dogs, pigs, and pearls means more than don't waste your breath on people who aren't listening. We don't really need any encouragement to give up sharing the gospel. That's something we do quite easily when we get discouraged. That might be true perhaps as a secondary meaning, but I believe this passage in its central primary meeting, me meaning is talking about something precious and beautiful, and it's talking about you, the deepest part of you. It seems when we receive Christ and become part of his kingdom, something countless people do all over the world, sometimes in a straightforward way, sometimes in a dramatic way, something beautiful happens within us that God does. This week I read the testimony of a woman called Mohina uh, uh, Krishna. Um, from the moment she was engaged to be married, she experienced bouts of depression, loneliness, nightmares, and illness. It transpired that another woman, je jealous of her forthcoming marriage, had placed a curse on her. Finding no answers in her problems um, within Hinduism, she said, I started searching for the true God. If there is a God, I prayed, let that God save me. She said, that was my next step towards Christ. Where there had previously just been nightmares, she had a dream. In that dream, she was surrounded by water and she was approached by a man filled with light. She said, I felt his comforting presence, his all-knowing smile. There was so much love from him, he instantly took over my heart. I was swept off my feet by my heavenly bridegroom and I was just looking at him, thinking, is he going to save me? If he does, then he will be my God. It was the Lord Jesus. She said, how could Almighty God humble himself and come to a Hindu Brahmin who didn't even have any interest in knowing him? Mohina was baptized, she read her Bible, she spent evenings in worship, and slowly but surely, God led her to peace of mind. She said this, Jesus is not our medicine, he is our oxygen. That's a good thing to say, isn't it? Jesus is not our medicine. He is our oxygen. It seems when we receive Jesus and become part of his kingdom, when we receive in our hearts this pearl of great price, we become a new creation. We come through the death and resurrection of Christ and his imputed righteousness. We become holy. It is a gift of God, which we have not earned through our good deeds, but received through faith into the deepest part of our being. And into the deepest part of our being, when Christ becomes our Savior, we gain Him and His wisdom, His serenity, His purity, His integrity, His loyalty, His wisdom, His wealth, and His love, the love of Christ. And when God the Father looks at us, He not, does not see a heart full of sin. When we have been forgiven by Christ, He sees a pearl. Do not treat something which has been bought at such great cost and is of such great value as something to be squandered. In a world full of appetites which are out of control, stay holy and pure. In a world full of violence and upheaval, do not contribute to an atmosphere of accusation and condemnation. Guard the pearl of Christ in you. Give the best of yourself to God. Give the best of the day to God. Give the first fruits of your income to God. Stop looking at and judging others. Look to Christ and his plans for you. 
because once you have found that pearl of great price, never, ever throw it away. Let's pray. We're just going to bow our heads for a few moments as we think about the challenges raised by this passage, most specifically that challenge to personal responsibility and self-examination, but also that challenge to spiritual aspiration and to recognize our identity in Christ is comparable to a wonderful spiritual eternal life-giving pearl. A few moments and then I'll pray. Let us pray, and after I've prayed, without further comment from me, we will be standing to respond in worship uh, to God with our next song. Let us pray. Oh, loving God, we thank you. We thank and praise you that we've been able to look at this amazing passage from Matthew 7. And Lord, we understand the personal responsibility that you are stating before us. Help us before we even think of looking at others to examine ourselves closely and to be sure that our lives bear close inspection from you. Lord, we recognize we're all in the same boat. Whether it's a speck or it's a log, sin has interfered with our sight and we struggle to see things as we should see them. Help us to repent, not just because we feel guilty, but because you want us to help others and be those who bring sight to the blind. O oh, loving Lord, as we think about our aspirations, forgive us where we have looked down and we have not looked up and looked forward. Help us to be active in sharing the good news with others, even in this time of challenge. Help us to recognize that some will receive you, some will not receive you. Help us to maintain the order and the sanctity of our worship and of our praise that we bring to you. Above all, Lord, every day, help us to bring the first and best of what we are to you and not to squander our energy or our ambitions on anything that this world offers and its appetites. So, loving God, be with us, we pray, as we seek to be those who honour you in every way, who do not judge others in a pandemic, but instead look to Christ and treasure within us from him that pearl of great price. This we ask for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
where in a moment we'll be coming to our final song in which we take our offering to support the work and witness of the church family both in this parish and across the globe with our mission partners. Thank you so much for joining us today, wherever you are here, here in the parish or across the globe in another continent. And do stay online for a few moments after the service. If you have a, a YouTube or a Facebook account, for, get, grab a coffee, send some greetings or sort of best wishes or spiritual thoughts to each other. But before our final song, a closing blessing from 2 Thessalonians 3. May the Lord of peace himself Give us peace at all times and in every way. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>